All right, welcome back uh, after our short break. And we are going to continue with our review of house bills and we have H430, which we received, um, I don't know, a couple of days ago. So um, a, a Representative Black is here as a reporter of the bill. Welcome, it's good to have you here. I think it's the first time that we've had you in to testify in our committee. So I think so. Thank you, Madam Chair and um, Senators. Uh, so for the record, Representative Alyssa Black, um, House Healthcare. Um, so H430, which is a expansion of eligibility of Dr. Dinosaur to all pregnant women and income eligible children in the state of Vermont who reside in Vermont regardless of their immigration status. Um, so this proposal was brought to us by the Office of Healthcare Advocate. Um, being the impulsive person I am, I picked it up, <laughs> not knowing what it was going to lead to. Um, you know, just sort of researching the topic. I, I think it wasn't it wasn't something that had ever been on my radar before. I'm not sure it's really you know it's sort of that out of sight out of mind thing. Um, but meeting with various stakeholders and just learning about this really, really small population that we're talking about um, who really have no, no viable access to any sort of health care, except for, frankly, the most expensive health care that we have. Um, you know, talking to open door clinics and the free and referral clinics, which is sort of the, the clinics that serve this population, they don't serve children. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of at the mercy of the volunteer physicians. So if that physician's specialty doesn't allow um, pediatrics, then, then they have nowhere to go. Um, they don't do obstetrics. So, you know, these children, and parents are left with essentially bringing children to the emergency department. Um, and then, I mean, they don't have any ability to pay this. You, one emergency room visit is gonna be thousands of dollars. Um, some, of the, some of the patient assistance programs through the hospitals do not even extend that coverage to someone with a status who's undocumented, um, which means they can't even make payments on it. Um, anyways, so this is a really, really simple bill. <laughs> it just ex extends this coverage. Um, you know, it solves the issue of simplifying it. There's, there's this whole other kind of category. I, I'm sorry, there's really two categories of people we're talking about here. We're talking about our farm workers and we're talking about this sort of, um, these immigration statuses where you're, you know, you're applying for status, but you're sort of in this limbo. You've yet to apply, you have not been approved for it. So you're not covered during this limbo status. Um, I'm sorry, where was I going with this? Um, um, oh, I think you were- I know, clearing up, clearing up um, confusion because there are people who are eligible who get denied. Okay. And it just clears up the confusion. Everybody's eligible. Uh, regardless. All right, uh, this is very helpful. Um, thank you for your, uh, thank you for sharing your journey uh, in uh, supporting the bill. And uh, we will, um, we'll, we'll listen to folks and see what the, where the problems lie, but also where the benefits lie. Cause I think there's probably both embedded in the bill. And we appreciate your taking the time to present it uh, to us. I do have a question. Uh, one is the vote in your committee and in the in the House overall. Uh, so the vote in the committee was 10-0-1. Oh. And it was a voice vote mm -hmm. in in the House. Okay. And on a voice vote, I, I think there were two no's. Wow. Okay. So you did a good job reporting the bill. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was all because of me. <laughs> the other, the other question I have for you, uh, Representative Black, is: um, Did the bill? Then the bill must have gone to appropriations because there is a, a fairly hefty amount in there. It, it did go to appropriations. So the thought behind the bill was, um, I think that we we really wanted to get this going for fiscal year 21, I mean, 22. Mm -hmm. And um, DIVA ha has some really important upcoming challenges and we wanted to be able to give them some time to, to get this in place. So there is an appropriation. The appropriation is and this is to for the Agency of Human Services to stand this program up this year while DIVA is able to take the time to get this in place. Um, and the appropriation is based on um, the numbers that um, Department of Vermont Health Access uh, anticipates that it that it might cost to serve this population and additionally some um, additional money for outreach, uh, you know, grants to the various groups that serve these communities um, in order to be able to do outreach to these communities that they are now eligible. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, so, uh, I, you have a, a right-hand person here, Representative Houghton is here. Did you want to uh, add anything, Representative Houghton? Hi, thank you again, Representative Houghton, House Health Care Committee. Um, nothing to add, except I do believe the House appropriation vote was 11-0, is that correct? Yeah, Representative Black. 11 zero, zero. Okay, yes, thank, thank you, that's helpful. So it sounds like it was a fairly uh, unanimous vote all the way around with maybe two exceptions <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> okay. Um, why don't we, um, unless there are questions for Representative Black. Okay. We'll move on to um, go through the bill and, and Jen is here and, and, uh, and as well as Nolan who would have the fiscal note for us. And then we'll move on to hear from uh, Nissa James, and Corey Gustafson of DIVA and Mike Fisher, a uh, healthcare advocate. So that, that'll be the order of the testimony. So Jen, thank you for being here. Sure, I will put up the bill. This is H430. Um, and as you heard, it's an act relating to expanding eligibility for Dr. Dinosaur to all income eligible children and pregnant individuals, regardless of immigration status. It would add a new section in Title 33 in Chapter 19, which is the Medicaid and some other uh, medical assistance provisions <clears throat> that, for, that I've titled uh, Dr. Dinosaur Coverage for Undocumented Immigrants. It would direct the Agency of Human Services, which is the way we phrase a lot of our uh, Medicaid coverage provisions, not specifically DIVA, but the Agency of Human Services shall provide coverage under the Dr. Dinosaur Program to children and pregnant individuals who are undocumented immigrants, but who would otherwise be eligible for medical assistance from the state under a particular provision of the Social Security Act. I will note, and I think you'll hear it from um, DIVA, that DIVA does have some concerns about this language and um, some potential unintended, unintended consequences of phrasing it this way. So they may have some proposals um, to make changes to the language to achieve the same result, but without having it tied so specifically to the federal law. Section two would appropriate 1.4 million in one-time funds to the Agency of Human Services in fiscal year 2022 for the following purposes, grants or reimbursements or both. So prospective or retrospective payments to healthcare providers for delivering healthcare services during FY22 to children and pregnant individuals who are undocumented immigrants. Grants to Vermont organizations that work with members of Vermont's undocumented immigrant community or with members of the healthcare provider community to provide outreach and information regarding opportunities for children and pregnant individuals in Vermont who are undocumented immigrants 
to access healthcare services at low or no cost in fiscal year 2022 and thereafter. So during this kind of transition year with the grants and reimbursements, and then going forward under um, the Agency of Human Services Program, and also funds for implementing the technological and operational processes necessary for the Department of Vermont Health Access to administer the Dr. Dinosaur expansion as set forth in section one, beginning on July 1st, 2022. Section three would require the Agency of Human Services to provide information on the estimated FY23 costs of expanding Dr. Dinosaur eligibility to undocumented immigrants under, again, that language in section one, beginning on July 1st, 2022. So that information on the estimated FY23 costs would be included as part of the agency's FY23 budget presentation to the House Committee on Appropriations and House Committee on Healthcare, to this committee and to the Appropriations Com Senate Appropriations Committee. And then finally, we have the effective dates. So the funds, the 1.4 million and one time funds to AHS would take effect on July 1st of this year. The remaining sections would take effect on passage with the Agency of Human Services making coverage available to eligible undocumented immigrants under Dr. Dinosaur in accordance with that language in section one, beginning on July 1st, 2022, subject to FY23 appropriations for this purpose. And so that some of that last piece is what was changed in, on the House side in the Appropriations Committee um, to reflect that this is not, uh, not an, a commitment until the money is appropriated. And that is the language. Okay. Um, so, and we're gonna hear from Diva, um, comments on uh, specific comments related to their area of uh, oversight. Um, questions for Jen. So go ahead, Senator Hardy. Great, unmuting can take time. Um, uh, well, first of all, before Representative Black leaves, I just wanted to say um, thank you for jumping on this idea. I actually am a former executive director of the Open Door Clinic. That was the first job I held in Vermont. And I wish I had thought of this bill because there were so many times when we had to try scramble to try to find healthcare coverage for pregnant women or their kids. And it was really um, frustrating So I'm and sad. So I'm really happy that we're working on this and I hope that, that we can find a way to make all the details work. So thank you for jumping on it. Um, and Jen, my question for you is, and maybe this is also somewhat Nolan's question, but first of all, once, if a, if a woman is an un, as, uh, has an undocumented immigration status, she would qualify under this bill. Um, but then once her baby is born, her baby's status is that the baby, if, if born in Vermont, is a, is a US citizen. And that baby would presumably be eligible for Dr. Dinosaur under sort of quote unquote regular provisions. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And certainly the DIVA folks can, um, cor can correct that if that's not accurate. But I think income eligible right. um, children who are US citizens are eligible for Dr. Dinosaur. Okay. And how long a woman who is income eligible becomes eligible for Dr. Dinosaur as soon as she becomes pregnant um, or is verified to be pregnant, I think. And then how long after the baby is born is the mom, con does the mom continue to be eligible? Do you know? I think it's 60 days postpartum. Um, although I think there may be some expansion of that under the new federal law, at least in the short term, um, or an option for states to extend that to up to a year. Um, okay. But right now, I believe that's 60 days postpartum. 60 days. Okay. And then um, the presume, and maybe this isn't a question for Nolan, but once this, once we're through this first year of this transition with the $1.4 million appropriation would the appropriation for this part of the program were it to, if it moves forward, just be encompassed in the sort of larger Dr. Dinosaur budget or would there continue to be a line item specifically for this purpose? 
I think, uh, for the record, no line while the joint fiscal office. I think it, it says in the second year they would add that to the budget. So, so I think that in 23 it would probably be an initiative specific in, like in the. I'm thinking of I'm envisioning the Diva budget book, and it would be a line item where they show it, and then after the, the following year after that it would be base. It would just be incorporated into the larger budget. Eventually, yes. Okay. Right. I think it would be built into the base, but the, the important distinction here is that this would always be state-only dollars. That We would not be getting federal match on this. So whether they would list that out separately because it, it's um, handled separately, I don't, you know, Nolan knows the budget book better than I do. Um, but I, so I don't know if they would, in their minds, consider it Dr. Dinosaur or if they would consider it, you know, state-only dollar coverage for this particular population. But yeah, the would coverage probably... would be the same, you know, there wouldn't be a distinction between a woman who's qualified under this provision versus a woman who's qualified under the larger program, correct, in terms of from what From the patient has. side, right, right, from the patient side, my, my understanding, and that's why the language is drafted the way it is, although, I, as I said, I think it'll, it may need to, uh, to change, but my understanding of the intent is for the coverage for the patient to be the same it's just the funding side of things that would be different. Okay. So yeah. I think, this, and Nolan, I'll let you finish, but I think these are the questions that we need to, I think we should move ahead, listen to um, Corey and Nissa, and then we can have the, the discussion, but Nolan, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I think I was just going to pretty much just follow up on Jen and just be like, it would be uh, somewhere in the DIVA budget book, they might have it broken out along with all the other Medicaid eligibility groups that we have. Um, but I think that it would be really more a back end calculation. Got it. But from like Jen said, from the beneficiary standpoint, they would know, just like beneficiaries don't know now. Yeah. Okay. These are good questions that we're going to have to answer as we go along. Um, anything else, Senator Hardy, on that? Uh, not at this time. I just want to make sure that there's not some way that the services or the process or whatever from the patient perspective would be different, that these women and children would be treated like any other women and children in Vermont who qualify for Dr. Dinosaur. So you want it to be uh, nationality uh, or immigration status blind is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, we have to do what we have to do from the yes. sort of legal perspective, but from the patient care and, yeah. uh, you know, all that yeah. perspective, it is but, it is the same program. I, that's what I would want from a patient perspective. And I'll let Corey, you know, talk about that, but I think it'll, once they get that card that says Green Mountain Care, Nothing. They don't know. They just know they have coverage. It's all the back end stuff. So, for instance, we have all these different Medicaid eligibility groups, but people don't really know which bucket they fall into from the administrators. They just know that they have the services and everybody has the same services. So, I, I again, I'll let the commissioner comment on it, but I would suspect that it's once they're in, they're in and people, they get the same services as everyone else. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions uh, from the committee? Uh, for Jen or Nolan. Okay. And, and Nolan, at, at some point, we'll look at a, a fiscal note from you. Um, we don't need to do that right now. It's posted. If people want to look at it and have questions, yeah. reach out to me. Okay, good. All right. Um, so uh, Commissioner Gustafson is here and, um, and Nissa James also, who is the healthcare director for DIVA. Um, is here. So thank you both for being here. Greatly appreciate your taking the time. And um, we, you've heard some of the questions that very definitely relate to your role in this. And uh, so why don't you provide your testimony on the bill? And then I'm, I'm going to also have some questions. So um, I don't, you, you, you figure out who's going first and so on. Good morning, Corey Gustafson, Commissioner, Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, I feel like the questions that we've heard and some of the answers we should maybe can just knock right off. I mean, Nolan, first of all, Nolan's right. Yeah. Um, I think that once you're, you have your, you're in the program, you get 
um, treated similarly to everyone else, depending on provider, I suppose. I, I hear a budding commissioner in there, Nolan, so I might need your resume soon. Um, oh, I think we're here to inform uh, as best we can. Um, I think that you're right. There was, Jen is right about the language um, that uh, if it's going to be state only, uh, the connection directly to um, the way it's written might make it, uh, it would, I don't have language specifically for you, Jen, but you're right that we, we are going to probably need, if we would think we do want it to be state only, and I'll explain that why right now. The reason we want it to be state only is because the process would be different um, if we had hoped to get Medicaid match for the expenditures um, and different in a way that we don't think is beneficial to the member. The, the process of enrollment that we're talking about, um, I'm trying to leave the, the names outside, but basically the, the uh, applicant would have to be denied and then come back in and, 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 and they'd be denied for normal Medicaid and then come in through emergency Medicaid. And it's a, it would be different, it would be more complicated and we think it would be cleaner to do state only should, um, should this become a, a program that the, uh, that the legislature wants to have as part of its um, Let me uh, yeah. clarify that. So you're saying that not only for the first year, it's state only, but it would continue as yeah, such? That it would be most beneficial as far as process goes. It's basically to the question that Senator Hardy was asking. Um, what, how do we make this so that it um, is, you know, not the feeling of a different process and um, that, that making it state only allows it to be a more streamlined process. It's actually a more streamlined process on the eligibility, on the operational side for, um, for the execution and, and uh, of a eligibility determination. So anything that is um, less complicated provides for less opportunity for mistakes or misunderstandings or um, you know system failures. Uh, system by system, I mean the um, the technology. Okay. Um, so then then let's suppose after the first year, obviously the first year is an appropriation that is state dollars. And then the, the next year when it goes into effect as a, you know, ongoing program, but it still continues to be state dollars. Correct. How, if at all, does the state uh, get match for, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's what the state only part actually full, completely means, Senator Lyons. It, that, it I wanted that to clarify that. Yes, so there you. will yeah. be no match. Yep. No. And so it would become an ongoing expenditure of the state for it, initially it's X number of dollars, but that would change over time depending on demand, uh, how many uh, folks would be uh, in, eligible and in the program. Yep, that's all correct. Okay, so, so, and I guess um, when you presented this to the House Appropriations Committee, was there clarity on that or not? We, well, we didn't present to okay. House Appropes. Um, we, did, we were into um, House Healthcare to basically share similar to what we have here for you today, essentially the, the cost um, estimates, which you, I believe you probably have the fiscal note. So yep. as Nolan said, when that, that NISA worked with our teams on that. So that's um, one main reason she's here is if you wanted to go into that cost calculation. Um, I think the other thing we, we shared with House Healthcare is just operationally, I, I believe they, I, I know they listened to us um, about the, um, the system work that would be necessary to create a process for determining eligibility um, of the population. So um, we shared essentially the competing um, uh, efforts that um, are underway or will be underway very soon, just to make that, um, you know, every, every um, program or project has to have a um, implementation and it, it goes into um, the world of the other implementations that we have either underway or coming at us. And when I say that, I mean all the IE&E um, projects that CMS and the legislature 
and the rest of um, uh, you know the administration itself really um, has been pushing itself to move forward on. CMS is um, very, very closely watching our progress on that, those efforts. Um, you have uh, a budget approvals for um, for those IE and E efforts also, um, you don't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, uh, you know, I think that there are members of the committee who are maybe unfamiliar with the integrated eligibility, although I know we went through it both in institutions and, and other uh, in health and welfare and other committees last year, but um, just a, one sentence on the- Oh, that's, one that, Medicaid doesn't do things in one sentence. <laughs> All right, How two about sentences. This? Yeah, right, yeah two, um, two, the, two over, the overarching goal from, for the Agency of Human Services is that our eligibility system is um, able to process not just the healthcare as element of, um, of eligibility for our programs. As Nolan said, we have many different Medicaid eligible groups, but also that it's a sort of um, single point of entry for Vermonters to come in and access uh, all many different kinds of programs, so SNAP, um, housing, et cetera. That's the, that's the big, what do they call that? The big audacious goal, right? So um, we are, have been on a, um, uh, a pathway to this. It was and has been uh, quite severely hindered by our system itself and where we've found ourselves due to the implementation of Vermont Health Connect. And so, and it isn't just Vermont Health Connect that is what we need to fix, but we need to fix we need to bring eligibilities together while uh, fixing um, a system that is very much process-based. And so um, it's, it's a pretty complicated program and um, CMS is very interested in our um, continued progress. So that's how that kind of fits into um, what we have going right now. Um, the other thing is on our, in front of us, we have um, the, uh, end of the public health emergency. I think that's coming at us faster than any of us really will imagine, but it's coming quickly. And part of the, the changes that were made during the public health emergency was to not execute on redeterminations. And um, we will have to get going on those ASAP. That is another CMS. Um, I wanna say non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable that we get going. How quickly we have to get those done, we, will, we are trying to um, in, with through national organizations, negotiate a little bit, give us a reasonable amount of time to get those done. Um, every month that goes by is another, um, uh, you know, uh, time of group of people that need to be renegotiated. Although we are past a year, so we're kind of, I guess that that is we kind of have a we will have a year of negotiate uh, redeterminations as well as doing nego uh, redeterminations. So. Um, it's kind of a doubling of the work that would need to be done. So the reason that's important in this context is uh, the people that are doing that work um, are also the people that need to test on systems. And so we're already constricted. The thing I just described about IE and E projects with the people working on the redeterminations, it's a, it, it, there isn't just another group of uh, highly qualified and, and trained Medicaid personnel who can test on the system. We need to sort of use them in both contexts. So that makes it um, a challenge. Uh, the, there are two others. There is our environments on the systems that are, are difficult um, to uh, do more things. We, we have a certain number of environments to test in. And so as we add things, it just sort of pushes back that, our ability. So. Um, the last um, piece I wanted to mention is um, ARP, the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan, um, contemplates or doesn't contemplate, it has, as it now will um, increase subsidies and um, that falls right into the same system. So we have to make system changes to um, address the increased subsidies. Um, and so Sorry that it's a long list. I usually like to hit a couple of points, but it is just, it does, it gives you a context of what we have in front of us. And I see Senator Cummings' hand, and I just saw Senator Hardy uh, raise her uh, hand. Actually, before, before, the, before I turn to them, I, I have two questions. And because you you brought up two things that I had questions about. One, um, and then, I'll, then we'll go to Senator Hardy and Senator Cummings. Um, 
the um, the ARPA funding and if and how any of the ARPA funding might um, support the work that we're talking about in this bill. That's one. And I, I don't know that you, you can answer the question. I don't, I, I know there's some guidance out about that. Uh, certainly um, the guidance does support uh, specific racial and ethnic groups. And I don't know about, um, you, you know, so citizenship well, may or may not be a part of that discussion. Uh, so that's one, that's one question. And then the other question that I'll ask off the bat, and I think Nissa might uh, be able to respond. And that is in terms of the, um, the costs associated with this, the ongoing costs, I mean, the initial, uh, I haven't looked at Nolan's uh, joint uh, fiscal note yet, but they are the, what are the, what are the differences between the initial costs and then the ongoing costs? for the implementation and then the ongoing operation for the program. Um, so, okay, so the on the subsidies question, um, there, so I was kind of referring to the uh, qualified health plan subsidies yes. um, and the work to do there. Yeah. But there, are, there is other monies. I mean, I think there are direct to provider. There's an appropriation in the ARP for direct to provider. Um, I don't know that there is a direct line to the conversation we're having now and the population we're having now to those dollars being dedicated towards um, that kind of um, serve those kinds of services. But um, you know, that's, I think that's the best answer I can give on, is there something in ARP that connects directly to this? I don't have that answer right now. We'll look at it again. Um, well, I think, it, yeah, no, I think it might be helpful because knowing that, um, knowing that funds are available might be able to, you know, clear the pathway at least initially. Um, the second question was the cost and the ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, the there's there is obviously the build the build on technology. Um, we have uh, um, uh, early estimate on pricing for the implement the DDI work of a hundred thousand um, dollars, and then costs ongoing. Um, we don't have an estimate on that, but okay, um, probably, I would say obviously less than a hundred thousand dollars of you know there's there's oh. the work that needs to be done by creating a a new program and to, you know i don't think it's a huge population so i wouldn't i wouldn't afford a huge amount of um staff time and resources to it um it of course depends on what the um the process based is um process for the eligibility determination and enrollment but um yeah. You know, I, I don't think we have a great estimate, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I just would say to the community, I wouldn't stress about that. I think that. Um, okay. I mean, actually, this is very helpful. Uh, and I, the, the initial work I know, which would pull you away from the ongoing IEE work um, is problematic, but the, um, if there are federal dollars that support any of the work initially, that would be good to know about. And then it sounds like the operational expenses become, because, you know, talking about a small population of people uh, is something that uh, at least our committee might be able to sell to appropriations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is, yeah, because we won't, because what I'm hearing you say is that we would not in the future years be eligible for uh, a match. Yeah, never say never, right? Um, yeah. If federal law changes and, and yeah. something happens, um, then I guess match could be a possibility. I don't think we have the, uh, I mean, we, yeah, I, I, I think that this is the, this, the proposal as it, as it is now, as a state only program is um, what we would say Primarily best for the met for the member or for the uh, eligible group. Yeah. Um, there is just you know it's, it is secondary, but it is true. Um, it would make a more streamlined process for determinations um, and for system, and so that 
is um, you know one of our priorities to not make things more complicated than they need. To be. Okay, thank you. Um, the, there is one, the other piece I just say is uh, we we um, well I, I think I'll I'll, I'll pause I'll stop. Okay, um, so I'd like to turn to Senator Hardy and then Senator Cummings for their questions, and then we'll. Um, oh, Senator Cummings is not is is saying she doesn't. Um, she doesn't. Her hand, her hand is up, and that's. Yeah, you I don't have I a see. question, uh, Senator Cummings. Okay, I was going to yield to Senator Cummings because I've been asking a lot of questions, but since she doesn't have a question, I'll ask my question. Uh, well, first of all, um, Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. And what you, when you were going through the sort of list of systems changes that you have to make over the next year or two, those weren't specific to this program. Those were sort of broader systems changes that you need to make for the whole universe of the work you're doing, correct? Yeah, th well, they're specific. They each have a specific thing that yes. they're related to, but they are not. Um, they aren't prereqs to this. They are um, just uh, the outline of operationally. Um, we have a lot in the hopper, and right. so right. consideration for that. Um, I was sort of outlining that we shared this with the House mm -hmm. Healthcare Committee, and they they understood that and gave us that um, timeline of next July, um, so July 2022, as a way to understand all those things. And if I did not recite all of them, uh, you couldn't have known. I apologize for how long it took, but that you're, you're correct. It's not okay. a prereq for this. All right, that's helpful to know. Um, so the, the timeline with the one year sort of buffer zone kind of thing, you're, you're good with that. You can, yeah. your team I, can work on that. We think we can okay. accomplish it. That's I mean, great. we thought we'd have IE and E done a long time ago too, but okay, that's a little well, joke. Should I'm I just hold saying, you to this or not? Yeah, no, I, I'm just, I, you know, I just say it as wait, like. Wait, wait, wait! Wasn't there was something it. that got in the way of that? Uh, um, I'm trying to remember. It's called pandemic. Yes. Yeah. So there always is. Uh, my other question: I appreciate your comments about wanting to make this state-only funding so that the process and the care and the whole the whole thing would be the same for people eligible under this program as it would be for people eligible under the larger program. And I think that is exactly what I was wanting and say, talking about before you testified. So thank you for sort of underscoring that and saying that that's what you're also looking for. Um, and my impression just we, uh, Last session, I was on the Agriculture Committee, and we did a lot of work on trying to find to get um, the payments for undocumented um, Vermonters, um, the 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 stimulus payments um, that most of us got to to provide um, equity payments for them. And Nolan actually worked on this with the Ag Committee, and we ended up not using any federal money for that because of the complications that that caused. So, I guess even potentially using ARPA money for this, I think could complicate it in a way that um, that is undesirable for moving this along. So I just wanted to put that out there. If you're looking at ARPA money, fine, but I, I, I'm, a, I'm gonna guess it's gonna make it more complicated. Um, and um, the, uh, now I can't remember my other, question slash comment that I was you want make, a second but... to think about it because I just yeah uh, go ahead you you hit on the um piece that I decided not to say which is on the idea of ARPA money um I don't think there's anything in there that we would drag into this process it was my comment was more about there might be ARPA money uh that it goes into this uh, healthcare into the healthcare that comes into Vermont's healthcare system that could be used for it, but that would be very indirect and not necessarily. So I, I think uh, we're all aware of what you're referencing. As, as yeah. a, when you inv involve the federal government, the money's great, the requirements and the execution becomes more complicated and sometimes not the best for the <laughs> staff or the, the user of the system. Right, <laughs> especially with the federal um, morass right now with, uh, immigration policy. It just becomes extremely complicated. Um, I remember the last thing I was going to say in terms of the sort of fiscal impact of the program. Um, I, I think one of the reasons uh, uh, they're not here anymore, but that the House was so in favor of this, despite the $1.4 million price tag, is that 
over the long run and even not such long run over even a short period of time, the health benefits and savings and healthcare costs to the system as a whole are, are, are very um, real um, because women have better outcomes if they have healthcare when they're pregnant and newborn babies and children have better outcomes when they have healthcare. So um, I think that that is not part of, the, of Nolan's fiscal note, but it's sort of should be embedded in our thinking about the fiscal impact of this. Well, and we'll also hear from Mike Fisher, who I'm hoping will reference that um, benefit to the bill. So- Can I make a couple of points on the money pieces or the federal piece as well? Yes, please. Um, so I just wanted to, to make sure it's clear because I'm not sure from some of the earlier questions that it was that um, a big part of the reason we're, it's state only dollars is because a lot of this is, is specifically not matchable under federal law. The federal law says um, we can't, do this under the Medicaid program. And so that's why we would be doing it with state only dollars. Um, but I think another piece to know, then Corey mentioned that it's it's uh, administratively burdensome to go through the emergency Medicaid process where somebody has to apply and get denied. Right. And then, uh, but that's also, I think only for emergency medical um, situations. Right. So it's, it's not preventive care for children and things like that that would be eligible under this kind of Dr. Dinosaur like program. Um, it, it's just emergency and emergency based medical care. So it's not as comprehensive as what we're talking about either. Right, no, that was clear, uh, but thank you. That was helpful. Uh, not, it's important to underscore that. Um, and Nolan, I did look briefly at your um, fiscal note and you seem to indicate that the ongoing expenditures would be closer to 260,000. I think Corey mentioned 100,000 after the initial implementation. Uh, I'm wondering, Nolan I'm might be talking wrong. about, I'm not sure what uh, the 260 okay. is. Uh, I was talking about the design development implementation on for the system work, not anything related to the expenditures on the program. Yeah. And, and it, okay. And the 260 was specific to the PMPM 100 kids. Just for the kids. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's just a part of them. Yeah. Okay. Got it. All right. And then in terms of the outreach to um, different organizations uh, to get the information out to the population that we're talking about. Uh, maybe Mike Fisher will be talking about that. So I think we should probably move to Mike unless. Sure, sure. I'll just say on that, that um, we don't have necessarily a plan, but we do have our sister groups, um, our sisters across the state that assist with qualified health plans and other Medicaid enrollments um, with that we partner with. They're not, um, we, we have uh, Victoria Jarvis is one of our people that works uh, all the time with them. And this would probably fall into that category. And then I, I think we would rely on other organizations um, that specifically, I think if, if you went down the path of appropriating dollars to be granted out in the first year, um, then uh, where the grants would go, we would be relying on those groups to really be communicating out. Um, and of course, Mike Fisher's organization. Okay. Just so you can bring us back for comments on that. I think All right. the program is one place to understand how that might be um, uh, not popularized, but you know, let people know that it's available. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank Very you. helpful. Nissa, thank you for being here. You're the backup. It's always important to have a good backup. Uh, and we, we appreciate the time, your, your time as well. And I, I just, <clears throat> I'll ask you if you have anything that you'd like to add at this point. So uh, Legislative Council, for the record, Nessa James, Healthcare Director for the Department of Vermont Health Access. Legislative Council had indicated that the department had provided some recommendations related to the language as passed by the House, um, and that is indeed correct. If the intent of the legislature is to create a state-only program that is administratively, I'll use simple, but we're really talking about as, as um, 
minimally burdensome to ensure that these individuals are covered. Uh, we would have recommendations for the language as passed by the House, and um, it really focuses on removing citations to the Social Security Act and uh, specific references to the Medicaid or Dr. Dinosaur program, because we want to ensure that we're able to implement the most efficient and flexible way for this expansion of coverage without having applicants have to go through the full Medicaid screening process, be denied, and then be granted coverage. So. That's good. I think I think that that clarifies, and uh, Jen also clarified. So now I think it it it's even uh, clearer. Uh, but if you don't mind communicating the language that you have, and I don't know if you've already um, done that, but it would be helpful to send that along to Jen, and then we can look at it and um, as we're reviewing the bill. Okay. Good. All right. Um, so why don't, uh, uh, anything else, Nissa? at this point? I should say Dr. James. No, but thank you for asking. Okay. Uh, Mike Fisher, um, I, need to, I need to grab another pen. My, just, my pen just ran out of ink, um, but Mike, go right ahead. I'm listening. Uh, thank you, Senator Lyons, and thank you, uh, Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Mike Fisher here, healthcare advocate. Um, I, I want to attempt to uh, sort of recognize the important importance of this moment. Um, this is a pretty phenomenal bill, uh, a pretty important bill. Uh, you know, at this moment, uh, for us to be able to consider uh, this sort of really important address, you know, way of addressing a, a, a recognized racial disparity in our healthcare system, and to actually do something about it. Um, is is really phenomenal, and uh, so I, I just want to you know before sort of launching into any details about the bill and how it came to be, I just want to pause and recognize that um, with full appreciation for the um, healthcare committee in the House and um, and for the House and, and for various legislative leaders, and now you for taking some time to address this uh, this you know longstanding recognized real problem in our healthcare system. Um, so to that end, we, we at the Healthcare Advocates Office um, brought this concern to the House Healthcare Committee last year at the worst possible moment. Um, COVID really interfered with any real consideration and really stopped me from bringing it to your, your attention last year. Um, and uh, so we took another run at it again this year, and we're just, you know, again, very, very pleased. Um, and, um, you know, I often, you, you've probably heard me talk about the different sides of my shop, the, the, uh, the individual advocacy side and the, uh, the sort of more theoretical policy side uh, that uh, tends to come to the legislature with concerns. Um, this, this issue really grew out of the individual advocacy side. You know, we had real people living in our communities coming to us saying, I don't know how I'm going to afford to have my baby. Um, and bumping into one problem after another, after another, after another, uh, sometimes without real answers uh, to help these Vermonters uh, be able to maneuver through, uh, you know, what should be, what we all would hope would be a joyous moment you know, give me the opportunity to say nobody should have bad debt on their birthday. Now I know it's the parents who have bad debt on their birthday, but nobody should have bad debt um, as a result of a birth. Um, that's maybe more aspirational. But um, um, so uh, because no one's talked about the numbers, I'll spend just a second. Um, uh, you, you know, we, uh, we talked with um, uh, the people who support the Farm workers, um, you know, primarily the Bridges to Health program, um, and also talked with the um, Immigration Assistance Project, uh, people who are supporting people who are seeking humanitarian status to try and get a sense of the numbers. Now, that's not an exhaustive list, but it is a, a, a substantial list of the people who are here without documentation. And 
I'll just say uh, overall, we came up with an estimation of about 100 kids and about 20 pregnancies. Um, so, you know, to uh, uh, Representative Black's point earlier, this is a relatively small population of Vermonters, um, but it has a, a substantial impact on their lives. Um, you didn't hear anything about the testimony that the House took. Um, and um, um, there, there were a, uh, a couple of, it, should you need, feel the need to take um, sort of more in-depth testimony to hear from people affected by this, um, both Migrant Justice and, uh, and Bridges to Health and the Immigration Assistance Project is, assisted in bringing people forward, uh, real people's lives, you know, to, to really describe the dynamics um, and, um, and sort of the pressures on them as they go about their lives here. Um, and uh, it, that, that, thank you, that, that's helpful. And we may call on them to bring some real stories to us. Well, they were in our committee last year as we were talking about um, some other issues and actually related issues. Mm -hmm. So that would be great. Um, so I just messed up my screen. So um, one of the things that we have learned some, uh, some about in sort of the process of advocating for this bill is, uh, is some more details about, um, uh, about a program called Emergency Medicaid. Um, there is a program called Emergency Medicaid, and it, and it is for people who are in true emergency who would otherwise be eligible for Medicaid, uh, but for their immigration status. Um, and um, my office supports people and supports providers in applying for those funds. Um, and so one of the things that be became uh, very clear to everybody and I appreciate uh, Diva's recognition of this and, and um, verbal commitments, public commitments to, to work on it. Um, it is tremendously underutilized. Um, you know, again, we estimate that we think there's about 20 pregnancies a year um, in this population. And um, I think we heard that they covered one pregnancy in the last four years. Um, so that means that the costs of those pregnancies are, um, are turning into both unpaid bills for people, I don't want to minimize that, um, and bad debt for the hospital um, that gets cost shifted. Um, to the point, so, so there, there needs to be some work there, uh, both on the provider community to, to know about this program and, um, and uh, and in communication, I believe, to people who would be affected by it in appropriate language. Um, <clears throat> um, so um, I, I think maybe I'll just uh, uh, list off the organizations who have expressed support for this bill. Um, Can I just ask a, a quick question before you go on, please? Um, so the underutilization of the emergency Medicaid is because of the um, problem in, in you know, applying for it, it it's so cumbersome, what, what would be the reason for not utilizing that? It, it, it is likely one part, what you just mentioned, uh, Senator Hooker, um, the com how cumbersome it is. Um, and I also believe it is one part, a lack of knowledge uh, about the program. Um, and, and while, you know, the likes of me is going to say, you know, hey, Diva, make it easier to do. Um, I, I, I understand there's uh, uh, federal rules that make it, uh, make it burdensome. Um, okay, so, so you're agreeing then with Commissioner Gustafson that, you know, to do it through the state, to fund this with state dollars would make it a whole lot easier. Yes. Yes, uh, and so uh, I'm sorry. The emergency Medicaid is a little bit of a side uh, a side comment. Um, you know, it it you know this this uh, proposal in front of you considers uh, a, a state funded program for children mm -hmm. and pregnant women, pregnant people. Um, um, emergency Medicaid is is eligible for all Vermonters who are here who are not eligible because of their immigration status. Yes, Senator Harding. Sorry if I can call on Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, nice try, Mike Fisher, but um, <laughs> uh, 
Well, I just want a comment on emergency Medicaid. I think um, the commissioner um, alluded to this or, or said this, that it is really an emergency program. So it wouldn't cover the sort of general care for kids that we're talking about, you know, going to the doctor and getting their annual physicals or because they have an ear infection or whatever, those aren't considered emergencies. And I think a lot of the prenatal care even is not covered. It's really just the birth itself yeah. is considered quote unquote an emergency, which is problematic in and of itself. And then though, you know, there's not the 60 day other period afterwards. So it's really just this single event that's an emergency. And so it's very limited in what it will cover. And the process for applying is complicated and and not user friendly. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 that also gives me the, the reminder of making the point that I'm sure everybody here knows, but it just needs to be said clearly. Uh, you know, everything we're trying to do in healthcare reform is getting the right care to the right people at the right time to avoid more expensive costs later. If there's any place where that is tried and true, it's in prenatal care. You know, it, if if the funding of this program over the next five years prevents one premature birth, um, we paid for it. Um, so, um, and that's just on the money side. Uh, I, I'm also here to say the human side. Um, well, the human side, I think, is really important. Really important. Yeah. So, so let me just, you know, we did, we did not do a really exhaustive search to try and find supporters of this bill. These are largely people who came to us when they heard us discussing it. Um, of course, my office, um, ACLU of Vermont, Vermont Academy um, of Pediatrics, uh, Bi-State Primary Care, Migrant Justice, Planned Parenthood, Vermont Academy of Family Physicians, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems, Free and Refer. Oh, you just, whoop, you froze a bit. Just when I was going fast. You were. Um, Keep I'm going. going to just keep going. Vermont Interfaith Action, Vermont Medical Society, Vermont Worker Center, and the Open Door Clinic. And then because of their um, association with um, the university, uh, uh, they, they can't express a real support for a piece of legislation, but were integral to helping us understand the population also bridges to health. Um, so th that's the list of organizations that have uh, step forward in one way or another to uh, support this effort. And um, I really thank you, uh, members of Senate. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, this, is, this has been a very uh, helpful, helpful discussion. Um, and I think we're, we're I, think, I think we're seeing the issue around, you know, state dollars versus federal match. You know, if we don't, if we don't match that 1.3 million, then we don't get another 1.3. You know, we're, we end up with 2.6 million less to spend on current and existing uh, concerns. However, um, it's probably more than balanced by the benefit that um, people are receiving through the state only program. And wouldn't it be nice if the federal um, folks understood these needs? But I guess, you know, it, it does raise the question. I, I don't want to prolong the discussion because I think we've, we've had a good, healthy introduction to the bill, but it does absolutely raise the question about how healthcare is being managed along the Mexican border right now and uh, what, what resources are being invested there to, to take care of people. Just, um, I don't know the... I. We've heard some of the answers to that, but does it go through FEMA? Does it go through other emergency funding processes? And then, what are the long-term um, what are the long-term policies that are going to be put in place? And and can Vermont benefit from that? You know, I, that doesn't not going to hold this bill up necessarily, but certainly something to keep an eye on. We'll have to ask our congressional delegation to keep an eye on that for us. I'll talk with uh, Congressman Welch, perhaps. If we can be of any assistance in helping you get people to the table. Um, Thank you, uh, I greatly appreciate that. And you certainly will be. Be careful what you, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> no.
Thank you. Any other questions for um, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate? Okay, we're good. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to suggest a two minute stretch and then we're going to move on to H153.